What if you knew of a mysterious book that turned darkness into light? Would you try and steal it for yourself or would you share it with the world? <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Friday Fantasy Show from the Bottled Imp. Exploring the realms of fantasy. My name is Ken Boiter, and today we're taking a look at The Secret of Kells. Yes, this is a film directed by Tom Moore, which is similar in terms of he directed another film that we've previously reviewed, which is Song of the Sea. Now, this film was released in 2009, so it is the first one of that type of film that Tom Moore and the production company were trying to develop. And um, a bit of a spoiler, I really loved Song of the Sea. So I thought, hey, you know what? What other things has this director been up to? And this is one of the results. So let's see just what is the secret of Kells. <laughs> just what is the secret of Kells all about? Well, the setup is fairly simple. It's all about Brendan, who's a young, curious, idealistic boy, and he lives in the community of the Abbey of Kells. And he is under the strict care of his very stern uncle, who is also an abbot, and his name is Abbot, and this is the first name that I'm going to struggle with, and his name is Abbot Kellach. So these are Irish names, so do forgive me if I mispronounce them. I probably, probably will. So yeah, so he's under the care of his strict uncle, who is the abbot of the abbey. <laughs> abbot of the abbey, try saying that quickly. And the abbot is obsessed with building a huge wall. Sound familiar? And he wants to build it around an abbey, around the abbey that, that he's in charge of, in order to prevent Viking attacks. There's been a number of raids on other islands and on other uh, cities. And, you know, this news gets to the abbey. And so he decides, presumably, you're not quite sure when they started this wall, but presumably let's say three or four years ago, because progress, obviously, this is a huge stone wall and it's going to take a number of years to complete. So the abbot is, yeah, that's where his main focus is. Brendan, on the other hand, he is an apprentice in the script, scriptorium, and I love that word, even though I can't say it, scriptorium. That's a beautiful word. I'm going to use that in my next fantasy book that I write. Anyway, he is an apprentice in the scriptorium and he hears from the other monks about a mysterious, magical, possibly magical book that turns darkness into light. And that's kind of all you get to know about it. And he is fascinated and delighted to discover that Aidan, again, I think that's how you pronounce his name, Aidan, who is another monk who is working on this mysterious book over in Iona. And that Aidan, with the book, is coming to the, the, his abbey because he's seeking refuge from the Vikings because they've attacked the island of Iona. So the book originally is called the Book of Iona. And so the uh, monk comes along, the, the, uh, yeah, he's a monk, I think he's a monk rather than an abbot. Anyway, Aidan, who has a book, he does successfully make it to the abbey where Brendan is and he seeks refuge. So they basically lock, sort of not lock him up in a tower, but they say, right, you can have this big, you know, the tower, and that's where you can continue to work on the book. Now, the abbot is kind of doing this under sort of duress. He's not, he's like thinking, well, this is kind of, a, he's not really that interested in the book. He kind of knows, he sort of keeps mocking the book, sort of going, yes, this so-called amazing book. But I guess his main focus is still on the wall and the protection of lives rather than, you know, a material thing that may or may not be magical. So there are many themes in the book of, uh, yeah, The Secret of Kells. And one of the main theme that initially you pick up on is fear. And it's that fear of outsiders. It's fear of the other, of the unknown. Because when people aren't of your culture, you have, I don't know, maybe it's in, in all of us, there's a kind of fear that creeps in that you, you, and what is this fear? It's a fear of being attacked, isn't it? It's a fear of because they're not like you, 
you're not sure what their values are, you're not sure what their morals are, you're not sure what their behaviour is, what their code of conduct is. And the Vikings obviously have a, you know, and they still do today, you know, have a really bad reputation of just going around and pillaging and destroying cities and taking what they want, basically. They, they're, they're raiders. So there's that fear that's built up. So what the abbot does is his response to that is to build a wall. This is how we can protect ourselves. That's his way of overcoming fear. So it questions, well, how do you overcome this fear? What would change that fear? How could you, be, you know, make yourself feel secure? And that's what the abbot decides. And I guess, you know, he's kind of made out to be the baddie, kind of, you know, he's, he's stern and he has to take these, you know, big decisions. But I guess if you look at it from the abbot's point of view, he has to be, he's responsible for the local sort of village that's around the abbey as well. So he's got a lot riding on his shoulders and something as a child you don't necessarily understand. So Brendan sort of is, you know, he's been banished from going outside the wall. He's never been beyond the wall. I mean, he's probably about seven or eight, nine. So, you, you know, why would you? But curiosity, and that for me is the next um, fear. So it's, it's the next theme that runs on from fear is, well, obviously people have a curious mind, don't they? Especially when you're young, you really want to know things. You're, you know, you, you're really curious about the world around you. And so there's always that temptation. Well, what's beyond the wall? What's beyond the wall? And the Abba, his uncle, just basically tells him, no, it's, it's, you know, it's nothing but badness out there. It's dangerous, you know. And so again, he tries to install that fear to, to, as a form of control, but you can see why he's doing it because he wants to protect his nephew. And it did remind me a little bit of that film, I think, oh, what's it called? The Village, I think it is called by uh, the director, and again, the pronunciation, Shamalama Ding Dong? No, what's his name, Julian? Yeah, M. Night Shamalama Ding Dong. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, so I was right, M. Night Shamalama Ding Dong. So forgive me, I'm, I've got slight dyslexia when it's definitely when it comes to names. So uh, yeah, so check that out. I'm, I don't want to spoil that, but it's got a similar flavour to it. So you can kind of understand why a community would want to do that and create fear within their own people, because it's out of love. And that's a nice, you know, you wouldn't necessarily associate fear with love, but that's a nice sort of theme to explore. So obviously being a child and, you know, you kind of want to grow and you want to be independent, Brendan's curiosity does get the better of him and he does, he sneaks out over the wall and you know he wants his freedom, he doesn't want his freedom restricted and what is outside the wall he, he actually does go into the woods and it's, I don't want to give too much spoilers away, but he goes in the woods because of a reason, he, he's actually looking for these little berries that will help the uh, Aiden because they, he'll crush them down and make them into ink for the book. So Brandon obviously is like, wow, I've now got a purpose for going out. So there's that extra motivation, whereas before he may not have gone out, he might not have been that brave. But this time he's got a motivation because he's fallen in love with the idea of the book because he gets to see the book. And so you have that really nice dichotomy of going, well, look, I'm going to rebel now. I'm going to, you know, I'm curious, I'm rebelling, but I've now got a quest, I've got a motivation, and that is for a good cause. So that is enough to override his fear. And as I say, there's a control and freedom dichotomy that's running through the whole film. And it's uh, on a wider level as well. So you've got the church, which uses stories, you know, for, you know for, it, I'm just using the Bible as an example, but all religions kind of use stories and allegories um, to kind of educate people. That's true, it is educational. So, you know, religion isn't all bad if you think it's kind of, oh, it's all there for controlling. But obviously, like any community, there is a certain amount of control that happens. And control is closely related to freedom because it's like, who is deciding what freedoms you're allowed? Who is deciding what is morally good and what is morally bad? You know, the freedom of speech, for example. Can you just say anything you want? Well, I guess you can, but then you've got to understand and appreciate people's reactions and, people, and, and the consequences that could come to you. You know, if I start, you know, criticizing someone really severely and maybe swear at them about something, that's fine, I could do that, but I've got to be prepared for that. They just might punch me in the face. <laughs> you know, I've got, to be, I've got to be responsible for my actions and what I say. So it is that, again, that sort of tension between control for the good of people 
and control that's corrupt control. Why is somebody wanting to put those controls in? And the Abba uses fear of, the, of, of a known threat. So it's not just, I'm making this up. He knows about the Vikings, people know about the Vikings, and that's why you, you, you know, the villagers are kind, they do, so we don't actually hear their voices about whether the wall is a good or bad thing, it's just being built. But you could imagine that the abbot kind of, certainly in medieval times, were, were very powerful. They, you know, they pretty much dominated, you know, the local villages nearby. So it's almost like they, they even if there was a protest, he, the abbot would probably ignore it. So there you go, you've got the religion, obviously that's a big main theme as well. And there's and what I liked about it, there was hints of this, and again, I don't want to give too many spoilers away, but there's hints of new religion replacing an older religion, you know, almost, you know, it's a, a pagan, ancient type religion. And it's interesting how the various tactics that a new religion might employ. One is obviously putting down the old religion, saying that their ideas are outdated and that they're wrong and they, you know, they didn't know, they weren't as intelligent as us, you know. And so, it, it, but equally, it's funny how in order to then persuade people to come over to the new religion, that, that the new religion will adopt and absorb old, uh, some of the old religion's um, pagan, uh, you know, rituals. So it's, it's a really nice way of doing it. So they've got, you know, on the one hand, they're, they're criticizing our religion, but on the other hand, they're actually absorbing and using some of those rituals and, and stories, but shaping them to serve what their new religion stands for. Plus we have imagination. Oh yes, even every cell drawn, these are all hand drawn by the way, this, this animation, reeks of imagination. So not only are you watching a really imaginative film, there's also the theme of imagination. And then the imagination again taps into this control theme that I was talking about and freedom because imagination can't be controlled by other people. It can be shaped, I guess, it can be manipulated, but your thoughts are your thoughts. And so there's a real, and that's where the book of Iona or the book of Kells as it then becomes known, you know, it, it's creativity is your own expression of freedom. And therefore, that's why it becomes very personal. You know, if you do a painting, if you do a, a bit of music, if, you know, whatever your creative bent is, it becomes very personal because it's come from you. Or some might say it's come from a higher place, but it's, you know, it's ultimately you feel like it's your little baby, your little child that you've given birth to. So, it, and I always find that creativity and, and the film explores this, it's very uplifting for the soul, you know, for a person's soul to be creative and create beauty. And it bonds people together for the good of everyone. Because obviously if I've created something, well, you know, use an amazing example, but if I've created something that's beautiful and I think it's beautiful, there's that need and you just want to share it with other people, to share that beauty, to share that love. And then when other people look at it or read it or listen to it, then yeah, they hopefully, their soul will be uplifted as well. So it really does bond communities. So overall, I really, really love this one. Just like the Song of Sea, it's done in the same animation style, which is very beautiful, it's charming, it's witty, there's a good you know, flow of humour that runs through it, and there's light and dark bits in the story. There's you know, quite a frightening bit where he goes into some woods, as I say, and there's sort of darkness comes and there's some really strange creatures that come at him. So, you know, it, it, there's layers upon layers in this film. It's intelligent and it's profound. It's got a profoundness that runs through it as well. And as I say, the imaginative side of it can't be overestimated because there's little, you know, there's little, there's so much detail in this. It's the sort of film that you could watch over and over again and then get something new from it as well. The story is gripping and it has a great balance of seriousness and humour, which is what I said before, where you need that, you need the light, and that kind of reflects the light and darkness, you know, good and evil, because the, the film ultimately is, again, a bit of a big theme, I kind of missed it out, but it's good and evil. And I think that's pretty obvious when you kind of start you know, when the, as the story unfolds. It's fun, it's joyful when it needs to be, and the animation style is beautiful. It's all got kind of influenced from Celtic, you know, the Celtic sort of knot, knots and the, the Celtic design and the illuminated, you know, books that you find, you know, in medieval times. Very cleverly done, it's beautiful. And, oh yeah, and there was also this young and old theme as well, that, that the old people, old knowledge is being passed down to new. You know, you need that in human society to evolve and to get better, hopefully. 
it's beautiful. The music is beautiful. I really, I almost, you know, I kind of want to buy it. So yeah, if you've got kids, they would love it. But you know, even if you haven't, it is a sort of film that as an adult you can enjoy because it's layered as well. It's got this beautiful folklore feel to it, the mythology, and it does t tap into the slight Beowulf um, story as well is a little bit at the end I don't want to spoil it as well so it's got lovely bits of fantasy elements running through it it's, overall it's got this real charm and, and magical quality and there is magic in there as well but it's got this magical quality really really enjoyed it so totally totally recommend The Secret of Kel <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed that review of Secret of Kells. It was Academy Award nominated for Best Animated Feature and quite rightly, as was the Song of Sea as well. So I kind of see them as companion pieces. I, I haven't done my research yet, as in have they done another one in this style? I really hope they have because I've enjoyed both of these films. And they're sort of along the ilk of Studio Ghibli, you know, the, the you know, uh, Howl's Moving Castle type quality, quite magical quality to it. It's a real shame though that it seems like it lost money initially. The budget was $8 million, which I guess is about £7 million. And the box office, it took $3.5 million, which is probably about, I know, three, you know, three million pounds, which is such a shame, such a shame. Why is something so good? It doesn't get the recognition, doesn't get, you know, you, you don't want them to lose money over this, you know, this is a beautiful thing because you want to encourage filmmakers like this to create beautiful, charming, intelligent stories that everybody can enjoy. So just to remind you, we do have a Twitter account. We've also got a Facebook account as well. We've got two things on Facebook. There's the page, which is the bottle Link page, and also we have a group where you can comment and post your own things up, all about fantasy, obviously. Keep it clean. And that is the fellowship. So if you go to Facebook, search for the Bottled Imp Facebook, no, what was it? The Bottled Imp Fellowship. Click the join button and we will add you in. We've also got loads of other reviews and we've got other stuff on the channel too. And if you love this channel, please spread the word of the imp. Share it with all your friends and family and even strangers. Oh yes. But remember to keep it unreal, especially if you like.